It's my sense of adventure, Mom. It's telling me we need to get out of the house and have some fun in nature today. Come to the forest where the more adventurous you lives. Check out discovertheforest.org for cool places nearby. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. Hello, I'm Sam Riddle with breast cancer survivor Mary Waters, who has an important message for black women who die 40% more than white women from breast cancer. Thank you, Sam. I want black women to listen up. We're dying too soon and suffering from undetected breast cancer because we don't self-exam or get mammograms. We must stop suffering and dying in silence. As a breast cancer survivor, believe me, early detection saved my life. It may save yours. Do self-exam. If you feel any type of lump, go to the doctor immediately and schedule regular mammograms. Early detection save lives. Thank you, Mary Waters. And if you can't afford to see a doctor, please call BCCCP. And this is the number, 888-242-2702. 888-242-2702. Remember, Remember early detection saves lives. WFDF Farmington Hills, Detroit, 910 AM Superstation, a division of Adele Media. The views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 910 AM Superstation or Adele Media. Good morning. You're listening to 910 AM the Superstation. My name is Robert Tano. And uh, we're going to have a great show for you for the next two hours here. I'm going to be joined by our usual panel of uh, Tom Chasky, Patty Bowman, and Tim Special Owen Burton. And it's uh, been uh, a week uh, of uh, a lot of political activity, yet uh, a lot doesn't seem to be getting done. There's a lot of frustration that seems to be going on. But before we get to that, why don't we touch a little bit on, because it looks like the showdown's being set up, and we're just going to click on it for a minute or so, is uh, Michigan State uh, winning yesterday, beating Indiana 20-15, to 15, and I think that's going to uh, set up the showdown for uh, October 30th around Halloween between Michigan and Michigan State. If uh, Michigan does a part, they will win. They had a bye yesterday. They will win uh, next week, and that will set up uh, two undefeated teams facing each other here in the state of Michigan. So, Tom, I know you're a Michigan Stater, and one of the problems is that when you don't have all, you don't have all your uh, guns firing the way they're supposed to be, that uh, the team still find a way to win. So, I think that's exactly what happened with Michigan State yesterday. They're often sputtering, but at the same time, their defense came through, and uh, a couple cuts watch plays, and uh, they're winning games that normally I think they would have lost a couple of years ago. I don't know if you Yeah, uh, you, you're correct, Bob. Uh, Michigan State did a fantastic job of hanging on by their fingernails uh, for that victory yesterday. But then again, that's what you do. A victory is a victory. A win is a win. So, you know, we'll, we'll see uh, if MSU can work on some of the problems that they've had. You know, like Bobby said, that the defense was very solid, and it was. And the offense just wasn't getting in a rhythm. But the one thing I want to point out, and this is what really, really irked me, is the penalties, the penalty, the turnovers, the little stupid things. And I'm not talking about, like, pass interference-type penalties. I'm talking about false start penalties, all these pre-snap penalties but there's absolutely no excuse for it. That sloppiness really hurt Michigan State uh, yesterday. It um, stopped some drives. Uh, it it uh, you know, blinked out a couple of plays, stopped some drives, gave them more skilled position. And you can't get away with that for you of them. Like, you just cannot. They were able to hang on yesterday. But they really have to work on some fundamental over this bye week. And if they do, I agree with you, Bob, it is going to be a real interesting game uh, on the 30th. Yeah, they had 12 penalties yesterday. I think they had over 100 yards of penalties. And uh, their offense they only had 57 yards in the first half, which makes it real difficult. Although they, they beat Nebraska that way, and now they beat Indiana that way. 
because we're not going to beat. Now you're getting into a real tough part of the schedule. You're going to have not only Michigan, you got Ohio State, you got Penn State. you got teams that are going to really capitalize to make this kind of mistakes. And I think uh, I think uh, Tucker knows that. Coach Tucker knows that, and he's uh, pushing it. And uh, I'm just surprised they did regress back from some of these penalties. Like they uh, look like they had cleaned up in the uh, major part of the year. But uh, uh, if, if they, they do get it straight down, they got to buy a week to do it. Uh, if they can uh, heal from uh, players, anybody that's hurt and things like that, I think it's going to make a big difference in what they do uh, from uh, October 30th. And uh, it's going to be a great showdown. Uh, uh, at Spartan Stadium on that day. They still haven't got a time for the game, but it's still um, what happens with it. So Yeah, I'm hopeful I'm hopeful Bob that we'll get a we'll get a night game schedule. Night game at Spartan Stadium. I mean if if, if like you said, uh U of M can handle Northwestern next week. Two undefeated teams, top ten matchup, it's gonna be huge. Yeah. Iowa lost yesterday, which knocked one of the teams out uh, out of the top ten. I'm guessing that's going to happen with it. But uh, now they're starting to play each other, so that's going to happen. Uh, and uh, it's, 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 a, it's a pleasant surprise for at least Michigan State, and I think even Michigan a little bit. People thought that uh, Harbaugh wasn't going to be able to straighten out the team, but apparently he's doing it so far. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. I'm talking about uh, difficulties and disasters and things like that. One of the issues that uh, is coming up politically is that I'm starting to get the real sense that the Democrats are having a hard time figuring out how they're going to get some of this major legislation passed. I see they're already looking at what they're going to drop or not drop. There's a whole sense that I'm starting to feel that people are starting to look at the competency of the administration and say, oh, I know he's not Trump, and that's why we voted for him, but he to be able to carry out some of the policies. I still, I still keep going back, and I thought it was a great line that Tom indicated when Tom said, look, if you don't deliver what you promise to deliver, they're not going to vote for you back in the, coming again in 22 or in especially in 24. So they got to start delivering on some of this, and it, and it seems to be uh, a whole mess that you see evolving here. Started with Afghanistan in August. Now the supply chain uh, is being broken as well. People are saying, well, we don't think you're going to be able to get things for Christmas. And you've got to wonder about that. Uh, people, you know, small things like that. And then inflation, and you got the gasoline. Uh, I think it's over 50%, or it's over a dollar more than what it was uh, a year ago. All these types of things that are starting to pile up, I think they're starting to really hurt the administration. And I think they got to lay off the dime and get some of this legislation passed to show that they can accomplish something. Uh, Scotty and Tom, or Willie, what do, you, what do you think about some of that? Um, I'm reacting. Did you mention me? Oh. I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Uh, I'll just I'll dive in and uh, kick it to Scotty real quick. You know, Bob, um, one thing I'll just say about the Democrats, I think that they are letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, like you said, they're talking about what can be cut from this larger package to make it a little bit more manageable. But those cut talks are also angering other Democrats. So, you know, like, like you said, the Democrats have to get something done. And we need these folks to be pragmatists. They need to realize just because the legislation isn't perfect doesn't mean that you can't pass something and then go on the campaign trail and say, we got this far, vote us back in, and we'll get even further. Yeah. Patty, what do you think about some of this? Well, you know, a lot of the stagflation, I mean, there's different things adding up to it, but I think a big part of it is um, just the incredible increase in debt um, that this country has and um, all the spending that goes with it. And then when it's setting priorities, you know, what, what absolutely must you spend on, it seems to me one good filter is simply if there is, um, you know, a majority of support, meaning um, basically not just on um, one party, but at a minimum support among 
Um, many of the members of, of two parties, not, not that there aren't more in the world, but of the um, two big ones, then um, that, that at least filters it down to the higher priority items. And so in my opinion, um, the items that would probably be of a greater priority to most Americans would be the ones supported by, um, you know, a majority, and that's, the one, that's what really should go by a strong majority. I mean, those are the ones that um, ultimately would survive. So to demand something different that maybe each group has their wish list, um, just, you know, that's one thing. But what, what's practical is, well, what it, does everyone agree is necessary? Well, apparently Manchin, the Senator Manchin, uh, has indicated that he wants the climate, uh, there's a restriction on fossil fuels and he wants uh, that completely dropped out because obviously his state produces a lot of coal. And and I think that that's going to impact the whole uh, aspect of uh, the, the climate change legislation that the, the progressives are trying to pass. It's the uh, uh, contradiction to what the bill's original intent. I'm talking about the, the people inside trillion dollar one now. The whole intent well, say, of what they want to happen. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd say dumping that is a no brainer. I mean, you know, trying to legislate the climate is almost in the same vein of when Arkansas passed the law trying to define, or actually it never passed. Someone proposed a lot to define pi as three or something. There's just certain things that um, the legislature doesn't have the power to do. Yeah, this was more towards the fossil fuel control, and I mean, it seems like a contradiction. Now the president asking that the fossil fuel, uh, if they can step it up with, uh, you know, foreign uh, uh, foreign investment uh, coming through for some of the uh, oil, which might mean the Middle East as well as uh, Russia. Uh, but at, uh, at the same time, if we're if it seems like what direction are we going in? Are we really going in the direction of changing, you know, trying to impact climate change? Or are we, you know, just sort of giving a lip service and when we really need the fossil fuels and things like that because it's an emergency, you know, do we, do we convert back to that and say, oh, you know, we, want, we really didn't mean the, the climate change? It seems like there's mixed messages that are coming out of this. And at least that's the impression that I'm getting. In all of the town, I don't know. You sort of was pretty closely. What, what do you think about all climate change and what Manchin's doing to really strip it out of the bill? Hey, I get exactly where he's coming from. You know, at the end of the day, all politics is local, and if this guy is seen as supporting anything that hurts the coal mining industry, gets his re-election chances goodbye. So he's doing exactly what he has to do. Um, I think that there's ultimately room for compromise in some of these things. Um, you know, the, the approach to climate change that this legislation seeks to do is both a carrot and stick approach. What is talking about is let's focus on the carrot, take away a little bit of the stick. Um, you know, for, for us here in the city of Detroit, right, we need climate change legislation. And I'm not saying that just because of all the flooding and everything. We need to make sure that we have strong controls on air quality. Because when we're talking about burning coal and, and these other fossil fuels, you know, diesels and trucks and things like that, it puts particulates in the air, and that causes our community to have much higher rates of asthma than suburban communities. We're not only exposed to it from the industrial facilities, we're exposed to it from the roads as well, and the international border crossings where you have trucks that still idle, even though we do have idle, anti-idling legislation in Detroit, we still do have trucks that idle and put all of this into the air. So while we talk about like this climate change legislation, you know, doing these big, huge things, I, I think it's important for us to kind of take it down a notch, focus on what can we do to help folks today, like especially here in the city of Detroit, Maybe there is some room for compromise, take away some of those sticks, and then we can deliver something to voters that does help move us forward and is just another positive step towards eventually getting us off of these fossil fuels and eventually towards 
a, a much cleaner power source or power sources that will give us, like specifically here in the city of Detroit, give us a lot better health and air quality. You know, how come how come people that make decisions or involved in policy issues, how come they never ask the people, what do they want? I would love to see that conversation takes place. Well, in theory, you know, democracy is supposed to ask people what they, what they think. But I, I think at times uh, the, the power that they are able to encompass uh, allows them to make decisions uh, regardless of what the, the yeah. constituents may, may think. But uh, you're right. Yeah. I mean, in a democracy, they're supposed to say, what do you think are the issues that, you know, we should be working on? Yeah, and I think, you know, Commissioner Burton is, is right. And this is an opportunity that the Democrats have. This is not like, you know, I, I don't get why these Democrats are running around so to see this. It's, it's just ridiculous, and they do this all the time. Uh, you can go to the voters. And, and ask them, like, you know, Willie, 100% right. Ask the voters. Go in 22 when you're campaigning a couple of months from now and say, hey, guys, if you reelect me, this is what I'm going to fight for. I'm going to fight for cleaner air, cleaner water, new jobs. Is that what you want? And, like, let's, and let's let the voters decide. Yeah, uh, uh, Scotty, you're the closest one we got to any kind of scientist here. Uh, it sounded like you had some doubt about climate change. <laughs> Impact climate change. What, what, what do you say about this? No, I, I, climate change is a sure thing. I mean, you know, there's no saying that. If there's one thing that's certain, it's change. You know, one thing that's constant, it's change. Um, we, climate change has been probably a fact of life for, you know, ever since we had an atmosphere. I mean, to go from what we had to what we got now definitely involves lots of climate change. Um, what I think is rather silly is this whole thing about, well, if, you know, people drive these things instead of that or we do this, instead of that, somehow that's going to have some big, um, huge effect on whether or not the climate continues to change. And the fact of the matter is it always will continue to change. It might get warmer, it might get colder, but change is inevitable. Um, can humans affect it? Maybe a little, but I, I don't think, think it's really significant. And I have yet to see the evidence that it is significant. Um, it's a, there's a lot of uh, money behind um, politicians that are supporting using it as a way of trying to control the economy and say it's changing in one direction or another, and that, gee, if we could only get this much control over the economy or on energy, which is really kind of the, you know, drives the economy, if you will, um, and then we can get more power, we can get more influence, you know, and there's more um, benefit to that. So um, that's, that's really how it looks right now. Now, perhaps, it, you know, if there is some um, if someone could show me evidence that was stronger, maybe I would, you know, buy into some of this, but I, I just don't see it. And the fact that they're saying climate change instead of global warming or global cooling or something else kind of throws out the idea of, well, you've basically created a totology. A totology is um, effectively an argument that can't be falsified because um, no matter what the outcome is it, or what, no matter what you put out there, it would seem to support the argument. So, just so we're kind of clear on it, let's say that we go to all electric cars. You don't think that would have an impact on, on the global, uh, on the global climate uh, situation, or do you think that, that really didn't changes it very little? Well, it may or may not, and, it, and then then the whole thing comes into how it affects the feedback loop. Um, for instance, let's say let's say you're talking about carbon dioxide, for instance. If more carbon dioxide is um, created, what does that do? That stimulates plant growth. And well, what do plants do? Well, plants consume more carbon dioxide and put out more oxygen. In fact, one um, historic example um, in prehistory is um, after a huge amount of um, volcanism increased the carbon dioxide atmosphere, the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere, um, we ended up having a huge number of plants grow much, much, much larger plants, stronger plants than ever before. But we also had more larger giant insects and so forth. And the way in which they could actually get enough oxygen to grow as large as they did was because the, the huge amount of increase in CO2 resulted 
the more plant growth, made more oxygen, and you ended up getting actually a higher oxygen concentration in the atmosphere than we have now. And that's what let, and they called it the Carboniferous period, because all those plants ultimately became what we now, or, or the majority of our fossil fuels come from that period in those plants that actually had um, a produced a higher oxygenation in the atmosphere than we had had before. Well, Scott, as you say, getting into the weeds, you really got into the weeds about that and how it, uh, how it operates. I didn't appreciate it uh, with everything. I know we're talking about Brandon Bryce. I mean, Brandon Bryce join us right after the break uh, is, is part of this. We have a number of other topics that are just going around, including, uh, you know, the challenge to the uh, clerk that's going on. We actually got a race that's going on there. We could also touch on John uh, Ruben's uh, email. There's just a lot to talk about. We'll be back right after this show. Take more time with you and different I made a decision. Every home needs a computer in this new age of technology. Get a computer for only 200 bucks. Can't beat that price. Call All About Technology now at 313-218-4888. That's 313-218-4888. We're All About Technology. Visit Central Park Deli today and receive 10% off any purchase when ordering from our mobile app and enter promo code 910AM. Our new menu items include gluten-free wraps, spinach wraps, fried spicy buffalo cauliflower, and sweet potato maple cheesecake. Don't forget about our always delicious Sagensburg corned beef, our fresh hand patty charbroiled 100% premium beef burgers, and our homemade teriyaki stir fries. Central Park Deli has curbside service available and DoorDash delivery. Come visit us today. Mr. Softy Toilet Paper is manufactured in Detroit, Michigan with two-ply 500 sheets and will bring long-lasting satisfaction every time. Quality is our goal, along with low cost, to give you the greatest bathroom experience. We've tested over 1,000 flushes, and it's septic-free, so you can flush with the confidence you deserve. For more information, visit our website at MrSoftyToiletPaper.com. That's M-R-S-O-F-T-I-E ToiletPaper.com. We've got you covered from sunup to sundown. My name is Robert Fakano. You know, part of democracy is that you have people that are on both sides of the issue. And also, anyway, you're going to get both sides of the issue. One of the issues is called qualified immunity for police officers, which is being debated in Congress. Police resignations or retirements are the type of occupation that's very difficult to keep people locked in. We are 910 AM Superstation. The following message has been brought to you by the doctors of horsely foot and ankle. Thick, dark, thunder. Ma'ams? We treat that. Those hideous bunions and hammer toes? We treat that. What about those thick corns and calluses? We treat that too. I suffer from foot pain and heel pain. We treat that. Even falls, breaks, and sprains? We most definitely treat that. Let the board certified podiatrist of Horsley Foot and Ankle Surgeons treat all your foot and ankle needs. Call us today at 248 559 5200. That's 248 559 5200. Horsley Foot and Ankle is Metro Detroit's premier foot and ankle specialist. Make your appointment today. Call 248-559-5200. Diabetic feet? We treat that. Painful legs and cramps? We treat that. Numbness and tingling? We treat that too. Horsley Foot and Ankle treats it all. Make your appointment today. Call 248-559-5200. Hello, I'm Sam Riddle with Breast Cancer Survivor Mary Waters, who has an important message for black women who die 40% more than white women from breast cancer. Thank you, Sam. I want black women to listen up. We're dying too soon and suffering from undetected breast cancer because we don't self-exam or get mammograms. We must stop suffering and dying in silence. As a breast cancer survivor, believe me, early detection saved my life. It may save yours. Do self-exam. If you feel any type of lump, go to the doctor immediately and schedule regular mammograms. Early detection save lives. Thank you, Mary Borders. And if you can't afford to see a doctor, please call B Triple C P. And this is the number, 888-242-2702. 888-242-2702. Remember, early detection saves lives. 
computer for only 200 bucks. Call All About Technology now. And if the laptop or desktop you already have isn't working, get it fixed today. Call 313-218-4888. That's 313-218-4888. We're All About Technology. 910, the super station. The oldest radio station in town since 1922. Good morning. You're listening to 910 AM, the Superstation. My name is Robert Scano, and we have with us a YouTube channel of uh, Scotty Bowman, as well as Tom Chowski and Police Commissioner Willie Bolton. We also have uh, joining us uh, a little bit from the right wing here uh, this morning, and they have, used to have his own show here on 910, is Brandon Bryce. Brandon, welcome back to 910 AM. Thanks for having me, Bob. And there's a lot of issues that are percolating here. Uh, we can start with uh, some of the national scale uh, president uh, and uh, what seems to be this free fall and uh, at least his popularity. We've had some earlier discussion that if the Democrats are going to write the ship right now, they got to get some legislation passed. Uh, and it seems like that there's this feud going on between the Democrats that is really making it difficult to get uh, any one of the bills, the, 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 the regular infrastructure bill of $1.2 billion or the $3.5 billion, which I think is being, uh, that's the human infrastructure, which is being dramatically uh, pared down, which, from what we can tell, Nancy Pelosi gave a deadline, I believe, of uh, October 30th for that to be passed. We don't know if we're going to be shooting past that, but you have that, and all of a sudden you have these other issues that have crept up that have really unfortunately attack this credibility. The supply chain that needs to be broken. You, you see all these ships that are outside the uh, ports in California. Uh, inflation that seems uh, that was supposed to be uh, temporary has gone in a more permanent basis now. Uh, the, the only good news about inflation is that uh, Social Security checks will go up about 5.9 to 6% because of the, of the COLA that's attached to it. The Voting uh, uh, Rights Act uh, that I think they're trying to pass nationally doesn't look like it's gaining any traction. And um, right now, uh, he seems to be avoiding the press. Whenever he uh, has an announcement, he goes out and speaks, uh, he will not take questions, which uh, seems to give more of an image of hiding or not wanting to discuss some of these issues. So, I don't know, from your perspective, it's... uh, the only thing I think the Democrats really have going for them right now is that uh, Donald Trump keeps wanting to strangle the party. Uh, but if you had a, uh, a traditional Republican candidate, I think uh, there would be a lot more people in trouble on the Democratic side. So what are some of your observations? Of you, you know, Bob, you know, I, I asked the question, uh, will the real Joe Biden please stand up? You know, he, he, here's, here's the big problem. Oh, by the way, uh, his poll numbers are now 36%, so they've dropped another 2% in the last uh, weekend. The reality is this administration is is way over its head. Um, You know, I don't know if folks of your callers realize the man has a majority in Washington. Now, for you folks who probably, you know, didn't get through a civics class, when a president has a majority, that means they can actually pass stuff without having to deal with the other party. Republicans don't control the Senate. They don't control the House. So now my question is, what's the excuse? What's the problem? Why can't they resolve the $1.2 billion infrastructure bill? I'll tell you why. It's a bad bill. And now that means there are Democrats that are saying, wait a minute. This doesn't sound right, because at the end of the day, Bob, you and I know, they got to go back home and get reelected. And Washington is all about self-preservation. The other thing is, and and I think we need to give credit where credit is due, uh, when it comes to the supply chain line, it was not the Biden administration that opened the port. It was the governor of Florida that opened the port. And so I think we need to be very careful in looking at the fact that I think Democrats, or let me say it this way, conservative Democrats, you know, the kind of Democrats that actually uh, win elections, 
uh, there, there is a civil war right now amongst progressives and, 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 and what they call blue dogs or conservative Dems. But I think that Democrats, smart Democrats, are starting to wake up and say, hey, the ship is, is sailing. Uh, this administration has some very serious problems. And here's the worst part about it, Bob. This is only year one. Well, you can join us in the conversation at 213-778-7600. It's 213-778-7600. Uh, yeah, it, it's real one. Usually the stuff that, politically, usually the stuff that's ugly that you want to get past that might be controversial, you usually try to do it within the first year of your administration or, or first two years of it. Uh, it seems to have boomerang, though, in terms of it's dragging the president, it's dragging the president down and as some parts of the bill become evident like for example i'm starting to see a lot more about the 600 dollars transaction uh reporting to the irs now for people that are not familiar with with that any transaction it can be between parties it can be between you and the bank anything over 600 dollars now at least in the legislation they want it to be reported to the irs they're saying that that's going to help them cat, catch more uh, people that are cheating on their taxes and, and things such as that. Uh, people are very uncomfortable with that. I don't think a lot of people like the $600 uh, as the threshold for a government to be poking around and to look at uh, it being uh, uh, available to the IRS and, and uh, starting to track it. So these type of issues, I think, are starting to – just really, uh, unfortunately, to me anyway, unfortunately, impact the party in trying to get this legislation passed. The more they bring these type of things up, I think that the Democrats have allowed it to focus on the $3.5 trillion instead of asking some of the programs that it might be implemented that's part of it. But I think uh, right now I get the sense that it's a drift and that, does the White House know how to try to take control of it? I think it's real difficult for them right now. You know, Bob, it, what's interesting is if Joe Biden can't get stuff done in year one when his party is in control, that's the irony here. Republicans don't control Washington. If he can't well, get I, I know, stuff done the fil- now. The, fil- the filibuster does have a big impact. Do you really have, but you know, but you have, Bob, 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 you and I both know, okay, well, you can talk about, you can say that, but the reality is the Democrats control the House and the Democrats control the Senate, and if he can't negotiate with his own party, which we knew coming in that the progressives really didn't want him, he was really never their guy. But what's interesting, Bob, if he can't get stuff done now, we're now in, I don't know if you saw, in Nevada, uh, a seat that had been Democratic for, I believe it was the last two decades, just went Republican. In Iowa, a seat that had been Democrat for almost 30 years just went Republican. That's a sign of things to come. So now, if he can't get stuff done now, what is, he, what is the Biden administration going to do if the Republicans take back the House? Yeah, well, at that point, they're not going to be successful whatsoever. You have some callers that want to chime in here. Mr. Positive, I'm spending your Sunday with us. What do you have to say? Oh, good good show, you guys. Brandon, you're spot on, as usual, big man. Love you. I just want everyone to listen to Brandon Bryce. He makes a lot of sense. He's um, um, not biased. He has the facts. And... Uh, I love it. I love it. The man knows what he's talking about. And uh, keep up the great work, Brendan. I'll talk to you later. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Take care. John, John, you're on. Hi, good morning, Ms. McConnell. Yeah, I just want to say about uh, why the Democrats are having a hard time pushing this bill through is because people are finding out what's in it. And then you had uh, Nancy Pelosi tell the media that they're not doing a very good job of selling it. And then when you talk about the climate changes in the bill, People aren't worried about climate change because they're looking at the gasoline prices and the food prices. And my last comment is, if they want to talk about gluten, I just wonder would everybody in that room, or what I might have said 11 years ago, that might come back to haunt me. Gluten's a scapegoat. All right, that's all I got, Bob. Thanks. Okay, thanks. 
Yeah, uh, Brandon, I don't know. The gasoline prices seem to be really uh, hitting people hard. Uh, I don't know if you saw it. Uh, Klein, who is the uh, uh, chief of staff for President Biden, uh, retweeted uh, some remark about that uh, get high gas prices and uh, things like that are, uh, you know, uh, concerns only of the uh, wealthy, in essence, is what he's saying. Or, you know, those that have uh, uh, more wealth in the, the middle class. And uh, I, <laughs> it, it just seems to be tone deaf when you send those kind of things out. Because people are looking at the gas price. I mean, you go fill it up. And I hear stories all the time. It went from 30 or $40 to $70. And, uh, you know, Bob, people can You know, gas prices, it's not just gas prices, Bob. It's food prices. It's, uh, you know, the price of milk. Uh, you know, these are the things, Bob, that win elections. And, and I'll be honest with you. You know it's bad when Rachel Maddow, out of all people, is saying the Democrats need to wake up because the reality is, uh, you, you know, these are things that win elections. And I can tell you something, Bob. I believe when you start seeing districts that typically were Democrat and they flipped Republican. That's a sign of things to come. Now, here's what's going to be interesting. I think Donald Trump right now uh, is, is, is an interesting factor. One, because I don't, you know, I think the, the, the hedge fund guys that fund candidates, a lot of these guys, they, they've said they're not supporting uh, the president if he runs, if he tries to run for reelection. However, I think many Americans are starting to really ask the question, can Joe Biden do the job? And what's interesting is, I mean, I mean, Donald Trump wasn't, you know, wasn't much better. But here's the reality: is that the same situation that we saw, where uh, Republican governors and Republican congressmen had to distance themselves away from Donald Trump, we're seeing it now in the Democratic Party. You know, last week when I was on, I mentioned uh, Terry McCullough, who thought he was off the mic, who basically said in so many words, "I need to stay as far away from this guy as possible." Other, Repu- other Democratic governors are starting to think like that because they want to get reelected. So it's going to be interesting to see how uh, Democrats uh, distance themselves as this administration continues to say. Yeah, I noticed that they're sending in uh, President, uh, former President uh, Obama you know, to uh, campaign with uh, McAuliffe versus Biden going in like he did in California to, uh, to go uh, – Obviously, the poll numbers, and it's, uh, everybody thinks that his low poll numbers is also influencing what's going on in Michigan, that uh, our, our current governor, Whitmer, is suffering because uh, Biden's numbers are low, and it has this uh, tie bar effect of uh, what, uh, what uh, you know, impact it has in even our own state at this point. The, the, the inflation seems to be something, too, that, uh, people are starting to notice and it's starting to become more permanent, which is unfortunate because they had all of this. Uh, they bring up uh, comparisons to Jimmy Carter, saying that, you know, Carter was stagflation and everything else that was going on back during his, uh, at the end of his presidency. But you're hoping that that someone is going to be able to take control of the ship, meaning in the White House, and start to impact some of these, some of these issues. And I think the president gets hurt by not answering questions. If people ask him, you know, what are you going to do about this? What about, you know, they want a, a expansion of it. Not that people are concerned that the press doesn't get answers necessarily, but that he doesn't seem to take any questions. And they're starting to play that up now, which in the past they didn't do. You no, know, Bob, this is interesting because this is why. Again, for you folks who they've been been sleeping during your civics course in high school, this is why senators don't make good presidents. This is why, because they don't govern. They don't understand that their decisions, like governors do, like mayors do, like county executives do, which you were, Bob, the decisions you make impact people in real time. You know, Bob, this is interesting because, you know, it, there was uh, on um, 
on uh, CNN the other night, one political analyst mentioned that this could be the first time in probably 20 years that a Democrat gets primaried by their own party. This is interesting. You know, Bob, I'll be honest with you, because I think, you know, just as much as people have lost faith in Joe Biden, many people have lost faith in Kamala Harris. She's another one that's been in hiding. But but here's what's interesting. You know, as we have a few uh, Supreme Court justices that are beginning to, that are probably going to be opening up, we've got a couple retirements coming. You know, there's been speculation. Now, I didn't say this. I just I heard this off of, you know, just, just random news channels. There's speculation that um, possibly uh, the VP could be appointed, or I shouldn't say appointed, but could be possibly nominated to the Supreme Court, and that another candidate for VP could possibly serve in that role to get, to hold the seat uh, and that if anything, you know, were to happen to the president. I'll be honest with you. I actually think at this stage uh, that if the Dems want to hold power, uh, that would be a smart move because I'm not sure uh, Madam Vice President can hold the seat. Uh, the other thing is, is that, you know, with Taiwan, there's some speculation on the right uh, that the president may put us in a conflict just to hold the seat because he can't do it any other way. So there, there are a lot of speculations going around. Uh, the one thing we know is that uh, the administration uh, is not doing well. And, I mean, I mean, you know, it's almost getting worse than Trump in the sense that it, it's only been year one, and we have problems after problem. We have uh, Afghanistan. We have vaccine mandates. We have Taiwan. We have high inflation. We have high unemployment. Uh, for all you, you know, folks, all, all, all you HBCU grants that supported Joe Biden, well, guess what? He just cut $44 million or $44 billion, uh, from the budget that, that federally supported HBCU. So there's problem after problem after problem. And the reality is it's time for Democrats to wake up and say, hey, you know, the house is on fire. Brandon, I'm just curious. Um, you know, because I'm going to my memories, and I can't remember any time you mentioned Carter, but even then, I can't remember any time before in American history when the economy was as bad by so many different indicators as it is now. Um, do you? In, in our own personal history? Well, here, here's the reality with Jimmy. Here's, here's the reality with Jimmy Carter is that the reality with Carter is remember. Uh, you know, Carter, we were coming off, you know, the economy was changing. Uh, when Carter was president, uh, we were literally going into, you know, leaving uh, one industry, really going into the, that was the beginning of the service sector industry. So that was, you know, the beginning of, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Factory jobs were starting to kind of, were starting to kind of shut down in the late 70s. The economy was changing. Oil was high. Uh, but not, I mean, to this extent, I mean, I, I think it's safe to say uh, the Carter administration, despite Iran, uh, wasn't as bad as this. I mean, this is this is problem after problem. And keep in mind, Jimmy Carter, if I'm not mistaken, uh, got quite a few bills passed because he himself, his first few years, two years, had a major had a Democratic majority in the in, in the Senate and in the House. Uh, the reality here is that, you know, similar to President Obama, who had a majority coming in, you know, th I think the biggest failure here is that I'm not sure the president uh, has really built the type of rapport within his own party to bring the progressives on his side, and it, it's starting to show in some of the votes. Yeah, he's having a real difficult time with the progressives, uh, although he, he tried to appease them by by not having the uh, vote on the uh, roads and bridges infrastructure, but I, I don't know if that's going to blow up in his face. But we have some callers that want to chime in on some of this. Lori, Lori, you're on. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I was to have a good morning again. I was calling to say that I really enjoyed the uh, panel discussion that you guys are having this morning, and the panel is doing a great job. But I wanted to say this about Biden. Um, I think I've been kind of listening to what they've been talking about, about the uh, 
John Lewis bill, and it has not um, been passed. And I just don't think he's doing enough um, to help get it through. So uh, Biden, to me, is just another uh, Democrat who fails in leadership to me. Uh, And I know we always look to try to get a better candidate for president. But, I mean, they should be tired of the same old people. I mean, Biden surely was uh, made a lot of racist statements, you know, throughout his career, not just now, throughout his whole career. So I'm not really impressed with anything that he's doing right now. So I want to thank you guys for uh, taking my call, and I really enjoy you guys uh, on Sunday morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Vincent, Vincent, you're on. Go ahead. Good morning to Yes, good morning to all of you. Good morning. Um, I just tell you, um, Brandon, he seems to always be on point. But, uh, Mr. McConnell, you, you, I, I mean, I'm so overwhelmed with this president, what he's doing. Not only is he losing the confidence of his party, he's losing the confidence of the NATO nations, our allies. He walked away from our allies. Now, check this out. You're talking about him falling in the polls. Uh, People are forgetting that he left thousands of American citizens behind uh, enemy lines in Afghanistan, which is a cardinal sin. And he walked away. But you go back to his words, I promise I will get them all out. And then to turn around and walk away with no explanation, he turns around and says he's going to revenge the 13 soldiers who was killed by killing the one who did it. And then you find out that it was, it was, it was uh, seven children involved in that strike that he killed. He doesn't even come out and make an apology. So the State Department does. But he certainly took credit for it at the time it happened. Oh, I revenged us. Okay, think about that. Where he's going, people are beginning to chant what? What are they chanting, Mr. Furcano? F. Biden. They're saying this at different places, at his stops, at his rallies, so to speak. You've you got to understand, for him t- to regain stature, he needs to back up and admit his mistakes and turn around by turning his back on the press because he wants to ignore the questions that will come. When are you going to get the rest of our people out of Afghanistan? He's not going to want to do that. And so it, 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 even to our allies, they're, they're preparing to go forward without the United States because they're questioning our sincerity of reliability. Come on now. It's not just um, – a bill here and a bill there, but his to, to leave American citizens behind and the media not want to talk about it. This is um, you got the people who are saying F Biden, F Biden yeah. because yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he's had he's had some of those incidents obviously that occurred uh, in the uh, some of the stadiums that they they that they show that uh, some of the crowd chanting that. At the same time, uh, it's not thousands of people he left behind, it, uh, which at one is one too many, but uh, I believe it's a couple hundred. Let me, this, let me share this as the last statement. The beginning of the evacuation, uh, this man, uh, the, the State Department, well, I'll just say the State Department says that it was uh, t- nine to 13,000 American people in Afghanistan to be evacuated. By the end of the evacuation, he said that he evacuated five and a half thousand. Okay, the, the numbers lay three and a half to seven thousand still there, according to the State Department numbers. These are the numbers they gave. And then you, you find that people who are gotten out other ways are saying they had to pay five hundred to a thousand dollars to the Taliban checkpoints in order to get through. And we shouldn't, they shouldn't have had to pay anything. Okay. We should have been guarding our own checkpoints. Okay, okay. This is a, I think, I think you, I think you've made your point. We got uh, other callers and we appreciate it. And obviously Afghanistan was not one of the finer moments of, uh, uh, how he closed that out. Although the American people did want it closed out, but, uh, I appreciate you calling in. And I think, uh, we know what your points are here. Thank you. 
Mike, you're on. Mike? Yeah, I'm here. Mike, are you with us? Hello? Hi, Mike. You know, you know, you know Bob, Bob, while we're waiting on the other caller, you know, you know, I'll tell you, I mean, this is what I would do. You know, if I were, you know, I think the White House has to make some very serious big boy decisions uh, in the next few months. Because if they don't, uh, this could be literally a, a blood, this could be a red wave both in 2022 and 2024, depending if, you know, Trump decides to run again or or another candidate uh, is put up. What I would do is this. Clearly, uh, neither the president or the vice president has executive experience when it comes to governing the state. And so my thoughts are, you know, if Justice Thomas uh, retires, which there are, there is a buzz in Washington talking about his retirement, uh, and this would be a hard decision because now the question is, would you lose the African-American vote, which probably they won't because most uh, African-Americans are going to vote Democrat anyway. I would appoint Kamala Harris to the Supreme Court, and I would select or bring in Gavin Newsom uh, or a prominent Democratic governor to fill that VP spot for two reasons. Let me tell you why I would do that. One, uh, it would help solidify – uh, competency when it comes to governing a state or governing the nation because you have a governor uh, who actually has that type of experience. But two, uh, God forbid, if anything were to happen to Joe Biden, now you've got a strong candidate that can hold the seat. Uh, I think, and unfortunately, America's losing hope in Biden, and I think also, unfortunately, America's lost hope in Kamala. And so I think the White House has to make some very serious decisions if they want to keep uh, the presidency without having to put us in a conflict uh, to do that. Thank you. That, that, that is a very interesting theory. I mean, uh, be an interesting move uh, that uh, uh, I think you take care of uh, uh, Vice President Harris if you could put on the Supreme Court. That, that's a very visible position and, and one that I think people would, would uh think that she uh, would ascend to, but then uh, the vice president uh, would be in the position to actually run, but you don't know if it would cross the wires in terms of people seeing that the, that uh, vice president Harris should have been the one next one to inherit it. it uh, it's it's going to be interesting to see how that would actually play out. It's an interesting theory if they were to be that uh, strategic in what they were trying to do. Uh, if we don't have your Larry, Larry, you're on. Turn that light off. Hello. Hello. Okay, I'm sorry. Is this Larry or Mike? Who is this? This, this is Mike. Go ahead, Mike. You're on. Hey, how you doing? How you guys doing? Good, good, good. What good. a question. Here, here's 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 the issue to me. You know, um, in and I, it's pretty clear. Every four years, the Democrats come. Uh, around calling on the doors of these black and brown people. Um, you remember during the debates, Kamala Harris called Joe Biden a racist. So when he comes to Michigan, he goes to Howell, the whitest community in Southeast Michigan. I mean, at some point in time, people can't just vote for Democrats. You have to vote for the person who's going to do the job, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat or something else. Frankly, I would take offensive tweets over what this president's doing right now. That's my opinion. Okay. I, 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 I want to throw this back out to the panel. I was surprised by that, that he went to Howell. I mean, I, I was – I have obviously a lot of my Democratic friends uh, who I obviously associate with were puzzled by that and couldn't figure out why was Howell picked. Maybe to help uh, Slack and because she's in a tough race or going to be anticipating uh, the congresswoman going to be in a – Tough race. She still hasn't committed to voting for the legislation that he wants as well yet. But uh, going to Howell to me was sort of a surprising move. Did it surprise anybody else in the panel here? Yeah, I, I get it, Bob, and I think you're, you're right. It has part to do with uh, making sure Representative Slotkin, whose district does include Howell and Lansing uh, and some other parts of Oakland County. Um, to make sure that, number one, like you can lock down her support for this, but then two, to also help raise her profile. The other thing this does 
is it helps Biden build up his image that he's working for um, what I'll call, like, you know, the, the common American, uh, not the urban American, right? The urban elite American, the, you know, the, the thought that Biden is a Democrat who works for New York City and Los Angeles and San Francisco and Chicago and doesn't work for the heartland. Going to hell was one of his ways of saying, no, 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 I'm not just gearing everything towards Detroit or Chicago or uh, Philadelphia or anything like that. I'm gearing stuff towards real middle America. Um, I'm thinking maybe the reason he went there is because he simply um, figured he had Detroit um, and, um, you know, this part of the state all in his pocket. And so he wanted to go someplace that he didn't have in his pocket. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Hey, Willie, you had a clip you said about Biden? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we have a very short clip. It was an interview with Ben Jones where he breaks it down uh, about President Biden and also about the party, uh, the producer. Can we go straight to that clip, please? And then he steps on a rake, and then he slips on a banana peel, and then he falls down the stairs with some marbles, and now people are looking at him in a negative light. Now, uh, can, can they recover? Yes, they can recover. Uh, if at the, uh, this time next year, if gas prices have come down, if, if cases are going down, jobs going up, uh, you're going to be in a different situation. But right now, the Democratic Party is, is looking over the edge of a cliff, and there's a lot of fear and concern. And it, it, you're not seeing that strong Joe Biden leadership that I think people were expecting to get stuff done, to get the next round of stuff done. So I would say it is unfair for you to say they or that he stepped on the rake. He felt it because if I were him, I'd be blaming my people in Congress for these fights and not just Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema. I'd be mad at all of them for making me look bad. However, the last point that you made, where is the Joe Biden who knows the game, who likes straight talk, who likes to get in people's faces, who likes to talk, period? Why don't we see him all the time addressing these things, press conferences, TV shows? Where is he? Well, uh, I mean, uh, when when he does that stuff, sometimes people you know get mad at him for what he what he is saying. I think a couple things. Number one. Uh, the next round of wins that he needs, uh, which has to do with getting the bipartisan infrastructure bill done and then giving the progressive something more than that. That's basically the formula. He's sitting on he's yeah. sitting on top of the biggest win any president could have a massive trillion dollar buy. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. Brandon, I always appreciate you coming on and giving your perspective. Very, very much. Enjoy the rest of the Sunday. And, uh, are you looking for a great deal on TV advertising? Are you searching for an avenue to get your business name out to the public? With WADL TV 38, we're offering a great special with 50 commercial ads for a great price. This offer is for a 30-day ad placement and can be renewed as often as you choose. Please contact Ronisha Williams for more information at 313-434-8291. That's 313-434-8291 or email at ronesha at wadldetroit.com. The Word Network has been broadcasting inspirational messages around the world since the year 2000. And we keep getting bigger and better and more innovative. Seen all around the world, we bring you the best teaching, impartation, singing, and inspiration. If you want original programming, we have that too. The Word Network is your exclusive source for all things inspiration. And we can be found on every device imaginable. If you want to be uplifted and inspired, you need The Word Network. Hello, I'm Sam Riddle with breast cancer survivor Mary Waters, who has an important message for black women who die 40% more than white women from breast cancer. Thank you, Sam. I want black women to listen up. We're dying too soon and suffering from undetected breast cancer because we don't self-exam or get mammograms. We must stop suffering and dying in silence. As a breast cancer survivor, believe me, early detection saved my life. 
it may save yours. Do self-exam. If you feel any type of lump, go to the doctor immediately and schedule regular mammograms. Early detection save lives. Thank you, Mary Borders. And if you can't afford to see a doctor, please call B Triple C P. And this is the number, 888-242-2702, 888-242-2702. Remember, early detection saves lives. We've got you covered from sun up to sundown. My name is Robert McConnell. You know, part of democracy is that you have people that are on both sides of the issue. And also, anyway, you're going to get both sides of the issue. One of the issues is called qualified immunity for police officers, which is being debated in Congress. Police resignations or retirements are the type of occupation that's very difficult to keep people locked in. We are 910 AM Superstation. Hi, I'm Hunter Ellis, and this is Atomic Beam USA. Another bright idea from Bulbhead, the ultra-bright, tough-grade flashlight that features tactical technology used by U.S. Special Forces. This flashlight has a feeble 125 lux output. The Atomic Beam USA has up to 5,000 lux. That's 40 times more. We're going to drop it hundreds of feet from this helicopter. It hits the tarmac, and it's still working. That's what I call a tough flashlight. Heavy downpours, mud puddles, even extreme temperatures are no match. You could spend over $100, or the Atomic Beam USA can be yours for just $19.99 with free lifetime guarantee. Order now, you can double it and get a second Atomic Beam USA. Just pay a separate fee, and we'll even ship them to you for free. Atomic Beam USA is just $19.99. Order now. Call 1-800-638-2619 to get your Atomic Beam USA. Call now or go to Atomic Beam. Com. So call 1-800-638-2619. Deluxe version available. Order now. WFDF Farmington Hills, Detroit. 910 AM Superstation. A division of Adele Media. The views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 910 AM Superstation or Adele Media. Good morning. You're listening to 910 AM, the Superstation. My name is uh, Robert McConnell. I believe we're going to be joined by uh, Edson Polis here in a moment, uh, just to finish up some of the discussion that uh, we were talking about and getting into some new areas is uh, reapportionment. Uh, Mr. Sopolis has uh, uh, been uh, hired by the uh, city of, I believe, Chicago to look at the redistricting of their um, council seats or their equivalent of their council seats and uh, has had some real problems with the way the people have put together the maps here in uh, the state of Michigan. Um, and uh, before we get started with that, I don't know, Tom or uh, uh, anybody else on the panel, have you seen those maps? And, and what do you think about it? It seems to be light on Detroit having representation at this point both on the congressional level and um, and on the state level. Well, I noticed some yeah. of the maps split up communities a lot, like Morningside, where I live, um, and I think had like something like three different districts in it, and, but it already has two in it, but they're going to have three in it. And it just it doesn't seem like they're really keeping the maps compact and simple and not all gerrymandery looking. It seems like they're, they are gerrymandering just a different group of people doing it. Uh, uh, yeah, I agree with look. that either. It's kind of the, the districts that they've drawn, some of the maps, and they put out several different maps. Um, and so they don't just have, like, one proposal for a lot of these. And some of them just make really no sense, and they're trying to have, um, you know, some of these districts, like Scotty said, you're, you're breaking up neighborhoods, you're breaking up city boundaries, you're breaking up county boundaries, and there's no real rhyme or reason to it. Yeah, it, it, it seems like it's really struggling. Uh, just trying to check with Ed here. Is uh, our guest on, Mr. Sopola, huh? Okay, well, we haven't been able to reach him uh, yet at this point. Uh, there are some, uh, I, I know we're going to get into the reapportionment. Uh, uh, is there uh, any other, uh, just some quick react? Uh, and I'm diverting a little bit on John Gruden's um, emails in the NFL and it being released. I know uh, 
I don't know if you followed the story, both to uh, Tom and to um, Scotty. Have you? I don't know if, if you followed that. And does it sort of um, uh, help um, show that there's racism in the NFL and that it's still a big problem? That uh, a lot of the uh, older white ownership hasn't really taken control of that owns so many of the teams. Well, what I think is most troubling and and really speaks to the the racism issue is that these emails came out, but the NFL says, oh, don't worry. Those are the only emails that say anything homophobic, anything racist, anything sexist. All of our other emails are just fine. Trust us. Ain't no way I'm trusting the NFL, you know, especially after how this entire organization from the front office in, in New York to all the individual franchises, how they treated Colin Kaepernick. You know, this is an organization that is steeped in white privilege. And they're just scared that this Gruden leak of those emails is the uh, hole in the dam that could cause the entire cascade of just how this organization has, has operated for years to come out into the public. Yeah. What bothers me is that emails are public. Well, why is that? I mean, the NFL released it. It's, um, so uh, the NFL... They were doing an investigation on emails. Well, I think part of it, <laughs> not to get into complete conspiracy theories, but I think part of it was that uh, Gruden was, um, was critical of the uh, commissioner, Roselle, and at that point, I think that was a little bit of their way of getting even with him uh, uh, to do that. Now, I mean, that's purely speculation on my part, but I think it uh, had nothing to do with the investigation of uh, – they were investigating the Washington football team, just the Redskins, and some of the hostile environment, uh, sexist environment that they had. And so they collected all the emails. By coincidence, a lot of these other emails were – uh, leaked, I believe, to the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And uh, I, part of it, I think, might have been just uh, Rizal was not pleased with what Gruden had to say about him and some of his policies. But so I the hackers let it out. WikiLeaks or something, and then the NFL went and got it from them? Or how, how did this happen? No, there's a lawsuit, and these uh, documents were properly subpoenaed in the course of a lawsuit and an ongoing investigation. Okay. So these okay. documents were legally made public. This is not a, a WikiLeaks kind of situation. This was a leak of documents that had to be furnished and turned over as part of a legal investigation. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they were legitimately within the purview of the NFL. Uh, how they got leaked out, though, I think uh, – Somebody in the NFL office leaked it to the Wall Street Journal and to the uh, New York Times at this point. At least that's my speculation as to what happened. But well, I understand we do have Ed Sopolis on the line now. Ed, welcome back to 910 AM, the Superstation. To you. Yeah, good. How's your weekend going? Well, I'm doing good. First time on head. Yes. Go ahead. First time what? That you and I have uh, talked and it isn't around a holiday. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Well, it's Sweetest Day weekend, too. Yeah, yeah, Sweetest Day. You can count that then, yes. Um, just, I, I know that you've been real active on the reapportionment and the Michigan portion of this. Uh, these were, uh, I know our listeners are pretty up to date but and our callers, but basically what has happened is uh, there was a commission put together with a ballot proposal. Uh, the commission uh, were picked in theory by random by the Secretary of State. I think by just uh, picking them out of a hat, basically. And they were put on this commission. They were supposed to be citizens. There were certain rules about their political affiliation and things like that. Uh, some had to be Democrats, I believe. Some had to be Republicans. Some had to be independents and be able to verify that. Uh, but at this point, they have started to carve up. Uh, every 10 years, we go through this exercise of reapportionment, both on the congressional level as well as the uh, Senate and House level. Uh, in, in the state legislature. So there's been a lot of uh, pushback on the maps that they've drawn that traditionally under the Voting Rights Act and things like that, 
there have been protected seats in the city of Detroit, and some of that seems to have gone out the window at this point, and that a lot of people uh, are concerned, especially from Detroit, that uh, you're not going to have a majority or you're going to have a, a, a lot less representation, I should say, from the city of Detroit than what you've had in the past. Well, well, that's true. And one of the things I remember in a conversation I had with you over a year ago that I said this was going to happen, okay, uh, because the when you look at the makeup of the commission and the people who are driving the commission or the, the public media, the fact, are mostly communities who don't want to be part of Detroit as a congressional district, as a Senate district, or a House district. And you can listen to some of these meetings. It's like, no, we don't want to be with Detroit. We want to be with Macomb County. Or we don't want the Dury Dearborn divided. So the, the, the whole tension with Detroit has come about the fact is, is that uh, the Detroiters, uh, some of their commissioners didn't show up for meetings. Their voices are squelched at the commission or, or they're silent. Or then the people in Detroit or black leaders have been very silent during this process. So uh, when the work that I've done, and I know I shipped you a copy of it, when you look at what the, the commission has done, they almost ignored uh, the Voting Rights Act, okay? And and when you look at this, the Voting Rights says is that, uh, that, that major minority groups, racial or ethnic, otherwise, have the power to have their voices heard. And that meant in Detroit was the fact that uh, the ability to make up 13, 14 percent population, they should have some representation in the legislature and Congress, or their community, which is Detroit, have its say in Lansing. When you look at the plans of the fact is you're seeing something totally different. And I'll, and I'll go over some numbers for some of your people. In, under redistricting, the fact is you cannot try, you cannot intentionally reduce the number of black or other minority population representation from the previous census. Uh, secondly, you cannot split up a community into small pieces. So the voice, the power of a voting block is, is diluted. And you look at this plan, and you're saying, well, wait a minute, it may not be intentional, but the fact is that some of their, the goals of not being part of Detroit is causing problems. For example, 10 years ago, uh, we had two majority black congressional districts, okay? In their plans, there's none. And when I saw that, it wasn't impossible. It took me an hour to draw two black congressional districts because I also do redistricting. And so I said, hey, do you know major minor, majority black congressional district? It took me an hour to draw two of them. Well, uh -huh. that's a big no. And secondly, if you go back to the Senate seats, the state Senate seats, which is the key to for the, the, the city and the mayor have representation in Lansing. Uh, last uh, census, we, they produced, the, the legislature, five black majority Senate districts. Now they have none. And secondly, uh, as part of the Senate district, the fact is, is that the city of Detroit can retain 2.4 whole fully contained Senate districts because of loss of population. And if you divide them up to where the majority of Detroit, it's, it's like 4.7. They divided up Detroit into eight pieces, thereby being Detroit not having any district that's wholly contained or majority black or even majority Detroit. So it's possible in next year after the election, there'll be no Detroit representation, black or Detroit here. And so the question is, is in Detroit, the fact is, is that when you look at the, the, their districts, the Detroit could be represented by Bloomfield Hills, Birmingham, Canton, Farmington, Madison Heights, New Baltimore, Sterling Heights, and Clinton Township. And I'm thinking is that what do those communities have in common with Detroit? They generally don't vote together. So that's another flag that there's something I missed here. And then you look at the state house. Uh, Ten years ago in the plan developed, there, there was 12 black uh, majority state house districts. Now there's only two. And so the, the, the black community and, and the people in the community of Detroit are saying is that I thought this commission was talking about commu um, committing to protecting communities of interest. The black population, the Detroit population, is the largest community of interest in the state, and they're totally ignored. So the tension here is that you're seeing on the street is the fact is, is like every small minority group, except the people in Detroit, are being heard. And this would potentially could lead to lawsuits that this commission may not want to face, but it potentially could, could happen right on Jan January after the, the plans are passed. So, so it sounds like the average citizen that they were trying to draw in to draw these lines wasn't real conscious. I mean, did they have legal advice on the uh, Voting Rights Act and things like that? But really, it's sort of basic to starting to draw the lines. Well, from what I'm hearing, in fact, some of their experts were giving them information that I know that uh, has not 
made the test of uh, of law or in courts, some of their men, the way the majority of districts can be only 37% black and 44% thing, uh, definitely used maybe like in the state of Miami with all the crossover vote, but in Detroit, anybody who grew up in Wayne County knows the fact that if the base of a House, Senate, or Congressional is outside the city of Detroit, the base is, the money and the power goes to that, and the Detroit person loses and then ends up losing the election. And so... You know, that's reality check. So whoever your consultants are, why, I don't know what kind of data analysis that they did uh, to demonstrate that. You look in Detroit Senate seats, uh, David Kinesic won. You've got the Rashida Tlaib is one. You look at all the people that are from, that, you know, well, some of them are from Detroit, but the point being, Detroiters can't depend on the 30% base district to say that they'll have a shot at winning when the base is out of the city or the financial backing of these campaigns. So the concern here is the fact, who is advising them and how do they pursue this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have Brandon Bryce on. Does want to come on and ask you some questions? Brandon, you're on with Fitz Phyllis. Brandon. Okay. <laughs> we might be experiencing some technical issues. We get we get Brandon Bryce back on in a second. Okay. Uh, we do have some other callers. James, one of the James, you're on with uh, Ed Serpola. Yeah, hello. Hello? Hello, yeah, hi, you're on. Go ahead, James. Yeah, I I kind of been on about half an hour. You, you, I just feel like a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the black population has kind of switched against Biden when he did the vaccine mandate. You know, he said he wasn't going to do that, and then he did that. And I feel like that's kind of something a lot of people aren't talking about. And if you read a lot of the press now, like the New York Times, they've basically become lobbyists for the giant global pharmaceutical companies trying to encourage people to get all these vaccines. And there's no guarantee that this will be a yearly thing. Like every year, people got to take an injection from the government, you know, and that's it's a new thing on the earth. It's, this is something completely new. This has never happened before, you know. People are kind of, a lot of people are blowing it off like it's nothing. But the, yeah, well, there's an animal source. There's an animal source of all these viruses. You know, the swine flu yeah. is from a pig. Bird flu is from chicken. Uh, coronavirus okay. is from the wildlife markets in China. All these, you know, the the bad. Yeah. 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 And, well, we we switched that, James. I appreciate it. we switched a little bit off of that with Mr. Sopola here. But just to, to summarize, that uh, at this point. Um, uh, you do get a flu shot every year. I mean, uh, people do that. It, I know it's not the same as being mandated for the uh, corona, uh, but the corona is uh, so much more deadlier than uh, the flu, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, if you've had complete exposure to it. So uh, this is good. Well, that's probably, debatable, you know. I mean, a lot of these people are being, I believe they're being killed by the, you know, the ventilator process, which isn't really talked yeah. about either. Okay. Okay. And. And that's people are being put in a drug-induced coma to be put on a ventilator, and they're, you know, they're, they're, see, this is what happens. I'm getting shut down by you right now. Every time somebody tries to talk about this, no, they I'm get not shut sure. down. And so what's going to happen James, is we're all going to end up yet. getting mandated okay, vaccines and not being able to okay, hold a James, job. We're off, okay, we're off the subject. First vaccine was made from the Thank you very yeah, much for we, calling. We're going to talk about COVID-19 in upcoming weeks, but today yeah. uh, Mr. Robert Bertano does have a uh, – a scheduled guest, and we're talking about the congressional yeah. district at this time. But thank you for yeah. calling in. We will definitely address COVID-19 ventilators and those type of topics in the upcoming week. And we know that, you know, and so we're going to go back to the host yeah. and his special guest. Okay, thank you. I think there's another caller. James, James, you're on. Well, Mr. Sopola. Good morning there. Good morning. I have a, I have a question about the racism, if a white man make a statement to a black race and can lose his job and a black man get on the airway and say the same thing about the black race, should he lose his job also? Okay, well, that's a little bit off topic to hear at this point. Uh, I, would like to get, I would like to get an answer from somebody. I, well, I don't know. I mean, you can see, see the special that Chappelle is running right now. He's saying certain things, and it depends on the context that you're, that you're saying it. It always depends on the context. I mean, Chappelle is a comedian, and so he is saying things in terms of uh, 
his profession at this point. Comedians have always had a great amount of leeway in what they've been able to say and what they make fun of and, and, and things like, like that. Roseanne Barr? Pardon? Like Roseanne Barr. Yeah, which is uh, another one that uh, they had difficulties with it. But let's switch back to the topic. We have Mr. Serpolis on here of uh, talking about the reapportionment uh, that's part of it. So, Ed, do you anticipate that there's going to be a lawsuit uh, that's going to be brought uh, by uh, people in the, or by citizens or uh, the leadership of Detroit because this, these maps are so badly uh, drawn in terms of uh, representation of Detroiters? Well, I've been informed that there are a group of uh, people from Detroit and black communities statewide right now beginning to talk about raising funds and trying to identify an attorney to represent them in this case. Uh, the, the question is going to be all the time the fact is, is that can they raise the money because lawsuits like this go from 10000 to $300,000 very quickly. But I do know the group of people have met yesterday, they're meeting tonight, and they're meeting through this week about seeking legal counsel around this case. And I know that probably by January, uh, I know that on the Republican side, uh, they find uh, that what the commission's doing, you know, basically may potentially reducing Republican representation, and they may have to fund some of the black uh, lawsuits because of the fact that if you, if you work with the black community, then that distracts support from the Democratic side. Okay. Well, Ed, we're coming up to a break. We're going to be right back. You're listening to 910 AM Superstation. We're going to get back on the subject here of uh, the apportionment. Are you a business builder looking for support to solve issues related to business strategy, e-commerce, operations and processes, marketing or finance? If so, check out the Tech Town Training Series and access free on-demand video workshops led by subject matter experts. TechTown Detroit is a nonprofit business support organization, and we want to help solve your hot button business issues at your convenience. Sign up for our free on demand training series at techtowndetroit.org slash training series. Again, that's techtowndetroit.org slash training series. Get a basic understanding of business management, marketing, operations, financing, legal, and so much more at TechTown Detroit. The Tech Town Training Series is made possible with support from the Walters Family Foundation. It's time to make a change. Detroiters have lost $320 million in property under the current administration. These properties have been illegally foreclosed and profitably resold to others at the expense of native Detroiters. The Michigan Supreme Court has now held that those who lost their homes are eligible for compensation. It's time to get our equity back. It's time to make a change. Go to www.takebacktheD.com. Are you looking for a great deal on TV advertising? Are you searching for an avenue to get your business name out to the public? With WADL TV 38, we're offering a great special with 50 commercial ads for a great price. This offer is for a 30-day ad placement and can be renewed as often as you choose. Please contact Ronisha Williams for more information at 313-434-8291. That's 313-434-8291 or email at R-O-N-E-S-H at WADLDetroit.com. 910, the Super Station. The oldest radio station in town since 1922. Good morning. You're listening to 910 AM, the Super Station. My name is Robert Picano. I'm with the Expo who is uh, an expert in reapportionment and has, uh, in fact, uh, I think that you're retained by uh, uh, the city of Chicago or by an organization in Chicago to help uh, redraw some of their district lines right now. Oh, actually, yeah, actually, I'm under co- yes, I'm under contract right now in the city of Chicago to help redraw their, their political boundaries, specifically their city alderman seats, which are our 50 wards. And the issue of racial gerrymandering or black representation or Hispanic representation. Matter of fact, in Chicago, I also have to be sure that I represent uh, aldermen of the Asian, Asian population. So we have to balance the uh, pop contribution of aldermen from the white race, the his, Asians, Hispanic, and blacks to be sure they're equitably represented following the Voting Rights Act. So, yes, I am working right now in Chicago, as I did 10 years ago, when there's, there, there's a case where you have a very big a coalition of different groups coming together to be sure that there's equitable representation of all people living in the community, whatever your race or ethnicity. 
So do you think that uh, Detroit just got out lobbied on some of this? I mean, yeah, you know, in terms yeah. of uh, a basic yeah. group saying they wanted to be represented and they the squeaky wheel got the uh, got the oil basically. Yeah, well, I mean, all you have to do is, you know, you, yes, they, they've been out either because of lack of uh, uh, people being vocal from Detroit or showing up for meetings or being shut down or outvoted. Uh, you know, the best way to make the judgment, now this is, you have to be personal opinion, but all you have to do is review all the meetings and decision-making. The fact is that you don't see a strong black voice uh, in, in these meetings saying, what about us? Necessarily that they have to have a definite number of, of seats in the legislature, but when you go from 10 years of, of, you know, five black majority Senate seats to none and two, uh, two now and 12 before and no majority black districts uh, in Congress, the fact that does raise red flags and that causes potential legal action. I don't even know the composition of the uh, commission. How many are African American, you know? Do we know? Oh, there were. I know there were definitely two. Uh, and I know that one was replaced or had left that kind of stuff. I mean, the current makeup, I have not, I've been working in Chicago the last couple of weeks, so I haven't kept up to it as much as possible. Uh, but, but the point being, the fact is there should be much more voice from the black leaders in, in, in the black community, uh, from church leaders and city leaders. And actually, in fact, city leaders, because, for example, if Mayor Doug and the city council have nobody from Detroit representing them in Lansing, that's going to cause them a problem. Your voice won't be heard when legislation is passed. So I think this is impact not only the black community, but also the, the city council and the mayor on what the bills to get their voices heard in Lansing for appropriations and legislation. Okay. I understand we have a few of you. You want to ask Mr. Sopolis a question? Yeah, yes, I do have a Sunday to all of you. Um, let me tell you, it appears to me that many people who claim to be Democrats, like James Craig, are actually Republicans. That could be part of the reason why Joe Biden is having a problem. Now, as it is relating to this redistricting you're speaking of, back in, what, 91 or so, or two, when Malice Green was murdered by two white police officers and they were tried, convicted, of murder. There was an attack, it appears to me, that began on the city of Detroit with the elimination of recorder's court, okay, and some of the other things that have happened have happened since then. We at one time had, uh, what was it, four uh, representatives in Congress, and now we're, we're down to the two that they want to eliminate. And if you still have Republicans running as Democrats and racists running as Democrats, you now see the syndicated media doing a blackout on the black man who's running for mayor, that's Anthony Adams, on the black community, which is the majority in this city, and the issues in this city. Uh, one, one station broke out, I guess it was, Channel 7 that I actually had Anthony Adams interviewed. But when it comes to the real portion of that you're speaking of and the way they're carving up a city, um, uh, so Polis, is it approximately 712,000, I guess, for each district that is to be represented? And if that's true, the city of Detroit does not need to be divided up. They need to have its own representative. Are you familiar with, with that? And you speak uh, about well, yeah, it's, it's part of the Voting Voting Rights Act. Go ahead. If you want to yeah, well, oh, yes. Well, actually, Detroit can make the basis of two majority black congressional uh, districts, okay? Uh, Detroit, well, actually not Detroit, but the black men in Michigan, not guaranteed, but have the, the, the opportunity to say that the fact they, they should have a shot at two majority black uh, congressional districts. Like I said earlier, I drew two black uh, congressional districts, and then they were both based in Detroit. So Detroit doesn't have to be wholly contained of congressional. They can have majority black, two of them coming out of Detroit, which is, which is the case now with Brenda Jones and originally John Conyers, which now Rashida to leave to the fact. So I agree with you in Detroit's representation. But they don't necessarily all have to be contained. It actually can contribute to two black uh, congressional districts based in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And there's supposed to be a meeting on Wednesday 
at uh, TCF used to be Cobo Hall. Is that true? I believe there is, and also there is also there's a meeting tomorrow at the uh, 14th Congressional District on Livernois Also, uh, I think the committee uh, chairman of the part that there, uh, Rick Bur Block, is hosting one tomorrow, which is set up for Wednesday for those who are interested. I'm not necessarily involved in any of these. In fact, I just keep in tab what's going on in Detroit because I was born and raised in the city. My family came to Detroit in 1990, so Detroit's sort of important to me. Oh, darn. You're not here anymore. Okay. you okay. got to reconstruct. you got to reconstruct. He's still around. He's still around in Michigan politics. <laughs> oh, okay. All, all right. But we're looking out for a debate. One the reason why the mayor is not concerned about that is, is because he seems to be hiding from a debate with them. Okay. Yeah, and I'm so you can't okay. find him at Cobo Hall. All right. Okay. Well, actually, I was going to get him yeah, Robert, I was going to get into the recent polling numbers. Yes, uh, uh, Mayor Duggan is leading by a significant number over Anthony Adams, and so he doesn't need a debate. Uh, Janae Ayers is uh, moving back up where she was trailing Mary Waters. She's now tied with her second vote. She's leading. And the fact that uh, so that's those are the changes at large. And Janice Winfrey right now is very strong. If you don't want to know, proposal R has a legitimate shot of passing, and S has a shot, but it's a little bit more difficult for us, and R has a better shot. You know, I don't know if people know what R, the difference between R and S is. Do you know? Oh, definitely. It's, a big it's the order in the alphabet. I'm just kidding you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Basically, R is the <laughs> is setting up a task force to figure out how to raise money, not city tax dollars, but to raise money and dedicate it to economic development and, 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 health, and home improvement or educational improvement as a result of the, uh, the uh, past uh, wrongdoings to the black community city, Detroit, whether it's Black Bottom, the overtaxing of homes, uh, police uh, improper activity of people over the last 50 or 60 years, okay? And that's, uh, that's the, the fire to form up this commission to decide what needs to be done and where to raise the sources. There has been talking with Fee on cannabis to do that, as was done in Elgin Oise. Now, S is giving the people of Detroit the right to basically uh, manage the money that the city now contains within the city council and the mayor's office. Basically, change a portion of the city charter, allowing the city residents to pass a uh, something on the ballot when they, they wish to to dedicate money for their purposes, independent of what the city council says or the mayor does. Not everything, but specific purposes. And the difference is, is that uh, uh, S is changing who can spend money for the city. And ours about raising money through non-tax purposes or city dollars to help re, re, repair the damage done for the black community in the city over the last 60 years. I know at one time Detroit had four congressional districts, but because of the law and, and splitting, you'll never get close to something like that because Detroit's lost no, population. You know you right? No, you And also the population loss. Yeah, plus the population. No, no one's pushing for four. Anybody who's involved in the process of fair representation, no one's looking for it for it. But when myself and other people like myself who can sit down in an hour and draw two black majority congressional awards or, you know, or three or four black major uh, black district consented districts and if, if the commission can't do it, that seems kind of odd because, in fact, they said they're representing voting rights. I don't see that attempt here right now. You know, it was interesting. I know we, uh, we had a discussion leading up to this offline about uh, some of the Senate seats that were put together, like uh, Harrison Township in the city of Detroit. Which, Well, yeah, and Harrison Township seems to be a lot more opposite than Detroit, and they, they, may, they could end up representing Detroit in the legislature. Yeah, which doesn't make a lot of sense in, in, in terms of the way that it's uh, set up. Now, is it supposed to be... What is the basis they're supposed to try to do it, to keep communities together or to actually yeah, well, 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 the first rule, the, the, remember, communities of interest is not a priority under the voting rights. It's supposed to be addressed because race and ethnicity is a community of interest, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. But what the commission has done is they focus on community of interest first, uh, race and ethnicity second, okay? That's why there is now nothing against the Bangladeshis or the Yemenis, but the fact is that there's been more emphasis on keeping Bangladeshis tied between the Oakland and Macomb and, and, and the district. There's more need to protect the city of Dearborn for not being divided than not dividing the city of Detroit. Uh, it's basically the community business who never, always have been anti-Detroit They want to be part of anything, like the Gross Points, don't want to be anything with Detroit. That's why they want their Senate seats and House seats not as part of Detroit. So this is all about 
people saying the we don't like to be part of Detroit mood that's part of the effect of the commission and basically ignoring the key things about the of redistricting is protecting one person, one vote, and everybody's voice should be heard, including the blacks and Hispanics and those particular groups. That is not initially being the priority of this commission. It's more about communities of interest, not necessarily race and ethnicity. Jairus, Jairus, I believe you're calling in uh, for Mr. Sopolis. Yeah, good evening. I mean, I mean, whatever. I don't think you Europeans, I know you Europeans should be on the radio talking about our issue. Because our, you, you don't understand our issue. What do you, where do y'all get the audacity to come on a radio station that the format is indigenous and most other people who listen to the radio station are indigenous? But you, you racist gonna sit up there and talk about our issue? You don't know anything about us or our issue. What, are, what you're doing are brainwashing indigenous people who live in Detroit with that, with, with that misinformation. We need to listen to our own brothers and sisters. Okay, Joyce, we appreciate you calling. Enjoy your Sunday. Uh, 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 I find it kind of ironic that you're sitting there talking about how to get more representation for the city of Detroit. People have their own opinion, Robert, and the point being I've been invited by a number of different black groups in Chicago and Detroit to speak to them because I've been doing this for over 30 years and to share my experience working with black communities across the, the United States, what has been their frustration. I just took the time uh, independently, but I'm not being paid to do this. I took the time because I'm from Detroit originally. Are the voices from Detroit and Michigan all being equitably represented? I just think this commission has yet to, I believe, equitably represent uh, all communities of interest, including the blacks and Hispanics in the city of Detroit and their drawing of the plan. I'm not trying to speak for any population. Uh, this is an observation which has been, been enacted by voting rights for the last 40, 50 years. I'm saying there's something missing here. Plus, it, it, it advocates the position of uh, becoming an advocate for the city of Detroit and for African Americans in terms of representation. If we were to take these maps as they're drawn right now, there's a lot of people in Detroit that uh, right now would not have uh, adequate representation in the legislature. And I think that is, uh, that is true. That is true. People have to become aware of that, that, you know, not everybody's doing it for some uh, devious purpose or something uh, such as that. And we always know, and you know, right, and your people understand, your your, vote, your listeners understand that Macomb County votes differently than Detroit almost every time in presidential elections and local politics. So the question is, is why are you having Macomb County and some of these Senate plans representing, potentially representing the city of Detroit, depends on who gets elected next year. Yeah, it should make a big difference. That's part of it. Um, I know that you also observe a lot that's going on in the state of Michigan, what from your observation with the governor? Do you think um, that uh, she is surviving well right now, or do you think that uh, it seems like the Biden numbers are dragging down a little bit by his low poll rating that it's it's impacting her as well right now? Well, the problem is the fact is that in politics, if you're a governor of uh, uh, of a state that's uh, uh, of the party of the president, typically you you struggle and you you don't always win in the off year election. People out of power tend to win the gubernatorial in the state. Part of Whitmer's problem, the fact, is she has not had a lot of visibility around the state positively over the last couple of years. She had not a lot of, a lot of victories. And so her first year is based on Biden and whether his, his, his build back better is successful, that type of thing. Is she was much more aggressive and independent of Biden as some governors have done in other states, and she wouldn't be so dependent. But because she's not had a lot of major victories over visibility, she's not very visible as a governor around the state. So, yes, she, she's basically dependent on what Biden does to potentially win election next year. If you were advising her right now, what would you tell her to do to try to boost up her poll numbers? Uh, bottom line, I'd do what Bill Clinton did, create a lot of small projects and be successful with those, draw a line in the sand and, you know, keep it a line in the sand. That's what happened with Governor Graham a lot of times with her weakness with the legislature. She never kept a line in the sand. And thirdly, Spend some time in the communities, like Detroit, like Wayne County, because her base is in the metro Detroit area. And some of the reasons the frustration she's losing some court in Wayne County and Detroit is the fact is that where is she? And so she needs to get out and do the door knocking. You, you ran for office. You can't run from your office. You've got to get out on the street and you've got to do the doors. And she's not doing enough of that. Yeah, that's interesting. There's, uh, there's, it appears that Chief Craig is having a hard time getting any traction. I mean, I think I don't... I know we had a discussion that he, does it, do his people really understand Detroit and the uh, political implications besides just being a police chief? 
Well, right. Well, as a matter of fact, in James Craig, the poll that I just finished, Craig has gone from being at 14 to 18% support from Detroit against Gretchen. Now he's down into like 6 or 7% against Gretchen Whitmer because, as we talked before the last year, the fact the more he takes positions leaning Trump, that's going to reduce support for him in Detroit. And so the fact is, uh, so, and you're correct, James Craig right now was anointed as the Republican candidate a couple of weeks ago on Mackinac Island. The question is, how long can he retain that kinship uh, provided for him by the Republican Party if he continues to lose support in the people of color communities? Yeah, it seems like it's going to be difficult. Uh, one of the problems, too, that seems to keep piling up is uh, there's individual races, but uh, the president uh, poll uh, ratings continue to go down, and it seems like everything is piling up on them right now, from the supply chain to inflation to uh, not getting the voting uh, uh, bill uh, act being passed in Congress and, and things such as that. And it seems like that his presidency is teetering a little bit, and there seems to be a piling on that uh, once the impression is in that you're incompetent, that's very hard to shake. And I'm starting to get, as a Democrat, I'm starting to get concerned that that is starting to bake itself into a lot of people's opinion right now. Right. Well, because, first of all, he has, he has not found uh, a, 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 someone that he can blame everything on. Remember, most of his problems are from things he can't control. He can't control Manchin and, and the other senator from Arizona. He's being stopped by people with his own party. Uh, the, the supply thing had more to do with COVID, but you're correct. Who's ever in power has to take the blame for whatever goes wrong, whether it's their fault or not. You are totally correct. If he can't either f- switch the blame to somebody else or be more visible explaining what's going on. And the other thing, in fact, his support's more dropping because of independent votes, not because of Democrats. Democrats are still supporting him. His loss of support has come amongst independent leading Democrats to the fact that they're being, you know, they felt he was strong on COVID and all of a sudden Delta's coming up. So, this is a bumper way. See, bottom line, in fact, he's got to get a consistent message, build some support around things he can do, like Bill Clinton did back in his time, get some things, some minor successes, and so people understand that you're doing the job. And then the other thing is the fact he's got to get more people on to some speaking for him. He can't be the only communicator. He's got, to, for example, like Obama, he doesn't have a lot of people out there speaking on his behalf that we see every Sunday or on Saturdays or around the state. That's why he has to do a lot of his own work. Yes, he's in trouble, but a lot of it's because he can't control what's going on, but he will take the blame because he's now in charge. You see this just over overcoming the Democrats in 22 right now? Yes. Yeah, this is very key to Democrats because, remember, Biden will have no successes in five through 24 if he loses control of Congress. Nothing will get passed through, uh, independent whether the Senate's gone back to Democrat or control or not. Yes, 22 is probably the biggest obstacle to Biden getting reelected in 2024. I know you've had some insight on this because you dealt with candidates and things like that. But do they make too much out of the fact that he doesn't take a, a lot of questions, uh, that he seems to be protected or that he is reluctant to engage with the press? Does, does, the, does the public really care about that, or is it a time like this that really impacts people's view of why aren't you taking questions? That type of yeah. Well, every president gets the same hit. <laughs> and, Robert, even you, when you were in office, you took those hits. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so remember, Robert, all, as a matter of fact, I even said, well, where's Robert? Why are you asking questions? So bottom line, all the, the problem is he has to resolve the fact he needs to be sure that he's out there speaking, whether he takes questions or not. He has to remain invisible. One of the gripes we, uh, his party are having and people around the country was he was invisible the last week. Maybe intentionally, but the point being, the president does better when he's out on the sub speaking, whether it's, he takes questions or not. The last week was because he was being silent. That's why some of this is piling up. Yes, he has to answer some questions, but Donald Trump never answered questions. He never really technically ever had a press conference that he allowed anybody to have an answer to anything. So every candidate does this. Every presidential does that. Every elected official does. The question is how visible you are you when you're speaking to the public. That's why he has to get around the country, not sit in D.C., so if he is attacked on the media, he at least saying, hey, I'm still out here talking to you directly. If you're, if you're Biden right now, too, and I know we're going a little far afield from the reapportionment, but if you're, if you're advising Biden, how does he loop in the two senators that he's trying to get right now, the one from Arizona and the one from uh, West Virginia, uh, to make them 
compatible to pass this legislation. If the two come aboard, it seems like you'll get this legislation passed at this point. Well, well, well let's make a little bit of insider information. They all have not met in the same room at one time. Senate, House, those two senators, and Biden. Yet, they, well, eventually, they're going to have to meet in one room. They have yet to do that. Unless they all do that, nothing's going to be resolved. What's happening right now is staffers are working out the details where they can have something in common. It's like a conference between Putin and Biden or Trump and Biden or like that. There's no going to be all in the same room meeting where it's until both sides have something that they can say that we're coming together on. What's happening right now, none of these parties are in the room at the same time. You can't negotiate from afar. Phone calls don't do it. So the, when you see uh, Biden and Manchin and the other senator and the and senator leadership and house leadership in the room at the time, then you can know that we will have the issue resolved probably within a week. You have yet to sit down all the room at the same time. Yeah, that's interesting because Michigan used to have uh, those quadrant meetings where they had the that's majority right. and minority leader and the governor all sit down. I don't know if Michigan still yeah, do that. Yeah, do they? I don't know. Does Michigan still do that at all? Does Whitmer still well, do that? Well, well, well. That's only when they're not uh, bat by eating, bat by eating each other. <laughs> <laughs> because I remember, at least in public office, we you're exactly right. When we used to sit down with the committee chairs and with the chair of the commission, when we're trying to resolve something, when everybody is in the same room and you're sort of locked up, it gets resolved. Uh, well, correct. And, and, right. And, and I remember, I remember even, even you, even as being at the county executive level, you were in meeting for maybe uh, the mayor of Detroit and, and, and the county exec from uh, Oakland County, Macomb. You were probably because you had your own separate governmental entity. Things got done when you all got in the same room, especially along the eight-mile corridor. There was a lot of conversation going on to, as groups together. Yeah. Well, Ed, I want to thank you for uh, joining us here. Uh, any final thoughts on what you see the reapportionment and where it's going at this point? Well, I think your callers who said don't speak for them, well, then we need to hear from you. We need to hear your, your voices because right now in the redistricting process, the people from Detroit, the black women of Detroit, whoever you are, your voices are not being heard. I'm sorry you implied that I imply. I only become involved in it because of the fact I've been doing it for 30 years and I grew up in Detroit and I, my family's in Detroit. I just love Detroit. And, yes, we need to hear from your voice, not necessarily mine. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. You take care, and you have a great Sunday, okay? Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, we got a few minutes left here to uh, a couple of the issues that the public going to raise themselves, and I know we'll uh, finish up with the panel if, uh, we, can, uh, if we can do it. And things that I'm, I'm starting to wonder, uh, I look at our society and our community, and are we just becoming – a little bit too numb to it and just everybody screaming and, and going our own separate ways. I don't know how many on the panel saw the article about the woman. And she, it was in Pennsylvania. It was on a train, and she was raped on a train. Passengers observed it, and they didn't do anything about it. Nobody intervened uh, with it. But is, this, is this something that, you know, hardened because of some of our political interests, or do, are we just becoming so callous? I I just wonder from a, a perspective of uh, uh, Scotty or Tom or, or Police Commissioner Burton, what, what do you think when you hear a story like that and, you know, becoming so callous that, you know, passengers on the train, they see this and they don't react to it. They don't intervene to stop it at this point. Well, <clears throat> well the first thing would be whether or not the people that happen to be present were physically capable of it and if the attacker was armed. But if neither of those was the case, then there's really no excuse. And it seems at some point they actually become accomplices um, to the crime. And obviously if they're witnessing this and not reporting it and they have access to some means of communication, then they're also accomplices to the crime. And if people understood that, maybe they would um, be a little more motivated. Yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, amazed that nobody did intervene, though. I mean, in terms of, um, you know, that's one of the most violent acts that you can have, the rape. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know how visible it was or anything like that, but the police were upset, the, the railroad or the uh, commute uh, officials were upset and, and things like that. And I, I don't know, we just become so callous as a community now that we don't react to things that people just walk by. I mean, you hear stories and things like that, but... For that to be, you know, in such an enclosed space such as a train, it just, uh, 
it makes you wonder that if we become too hardened or you know too numb to what we hear every day. Oh, Tom, mm-hmm. or, or, go ahead. You, just, you know, Bob, like what I was going to say, um, we get these stories, you know, these kinds of stories about just the, uh, like you said, callousness of people and uncaring. We get them quite regularly. They don't always involve um, crimes as, as terrible as what you mentioned, but we have issues every single day with, um, you know, with, I've absolutely lived in the city of Detroit. And there's a lot of uh, indigent folks out on the streets. There's a lot of folks who are in need of not only food and shelter, but they're in need of medical care and health care too. And how do we treat those folks? We see the negative side and we always publicize the negative and say, oh, this is terrible. What are we doing as a society? But we don't recognize that we have some fantastic organizations that are doing some really good work out there that we have made, especially like here in Detroit, and here in the state of Michigan, we have made massive gains, especially over the last 10 years, in helping to reduce our homeless population and helping to ensure that especially homeless veterans are getting not only the housing assistance that they need, but the health care. So we're doing a lot, and there are a lot of good groups out there who are helping people. Um, so I, I just don't want us to take the bad when it happens and have that cause people to forget about all the good that is out there in the community. Yeah. The other issue that's raised itself is uh, that uh, the city council has passed an ordinance about the uh, tolling, and I know that uh, this has drawn a lot of controversy and a lot of people have been indictments over it. And it's seen, I've heard, I've heard people in the media say, yeah, we've heard rumors about it for the past 10, 15 years, which is pretty amazing to me that these rumors can keep circulating. Uh, and yet it seems like people continue to engage in these illegal type of practices, and towers have an enormous amount of, uh, of influence. Uh, I, I know from personal experience I had a client that was um, – she, she was, uh, or his daughter, I should say, went to a location. Uh, it, it was a doctor's office. She parked there. She goes to a restaurant, which is next door. She uses both the doctor's office and the restaurant. So she came out. She got in her car, and there was a guy that uh, a towing company came and hooked up. And she goes, look, I'm in the car. What are you doing? Why are you towing? He says, well, you were... He used the parking spot that was for the medical office, and he went, uh, he stepped over, and he went into the restaurant for, to get a pickup order. She says, well, Five minutes out. remaining for the program. At, at, at that point, uh, they said that uh, the the, um, uh, the the hookup would cost two hundred ninety dollars to just let it go, and it had to be in cash. That if it was brought to a state to a location, it would cost you sixteen hundred dollars in cash to get it out. You hear these stories all the time, and I'm hoping that the new toilet ordinance is going to start eliminating some of these uh, type of uh, uh, stories. Scotty, I know that it's something important to you, and police push a little dirt as well. And the comment that you've come down on the in the, in the, in the past. I don't know. Do you, do you do you have much optimism for the new coin or is that the way it's been passed? And it's been put into the mayor's office now for it to run. I believe out of the uh, out of the department that uh, he he has his appointees run. You know, I have a feeling that the Detroit um, government is really out of touch with their people and are not fulfilling um, their needs, but are rather focused on maintaining power. I think there's an insider politicians where that's really their pure focus. And on um, as community advisory council chair, you know, I hear a lot of concerns from neighbors and members of the community. And but one of the latest um, wastes of city resources, as well as an act of voter suppression, is the city has actually been hiring um, people to go around and take down signs of political challengers. And, um, I mean, it's, there's actual, I actually, um, one of my neighbors caught video of people with a, a Detroit vehicle going around and doing this. For city council or for a bear or what, what position, you know? Um, city council and board of police commissioners. Hmm. Okay. I, I mean, 
nothing surprises me, but I'm surprised that they would use an official uh, um, vehicle of the city to be going around and doing that. I, I've seen other uh, people that have uh, gotten into big trouble doing that. Yeah, well, I was surprised, too. Well, I, I can say, I can honestly say that Scotty Bowman actually has the proof. I mean, he has it right at his fingertips. I mean, one of the uh, one of the neighbors on Out of Drive, um, you know, uh, basically reached out to Scotty and basically, um, you know, was able to capture some really good still images, you know. And so uh, the the question is, what would Scotty do next? You know, as far as um, you know, shining some light on this. I mean, um, I, I think for anyone to use a city vehicle to pull up signage, you know, um, you know, definitely raise some questions. But going back to something you mentioned earlier, Bob, about towing, uh, I, you know, if you look at police oversight boards. I think Detroit is the only board in the country that actually uh, has something to do in alignment uh, with towing. But uh, commissioners are not trained, um, you know, in any capacity on towing. I think we have to look at uh, what other cities are doing, look at best practices and procedures. And the question is, should Detroit Board of Police Commissioners be involved? And, and, you know, in a torn process when it comes to permits and, and things of that nature. Um, but definitely, um, you have to look and see what other cities are doing. Um, and, you got, and we maybe should stop. Um, people should really um, speak out when um, commissioners um, accept money from towers as well. I think that's really not appropriate, like, like Commissioner Bell. Yeah, well, one of the issues, too, is the CPRS ran an article about uh, city council members that have been big advocates for some of the towing companies, and they received a lot of contributions as well. That's uh, part of it. it. And the other interesting part is I have no idea if the towing companies are engaged in dark money, which means they can run a lot of ads, and you never know who's actually making the contribution uh, as well. Uh, part of that. One last thing, and I think we only got about a minute left, uh, City clerk's race. <laughs> Has that uh, risen to any level that anybody has seen anything uh, that you think is going to make a difference right now? Or do you think that it uh, looks like uh, Winchie is just going to uh, sort of glide in? It seems like the newest thing is not to say anything. She even refused an editorial, I believe, uh, interview for the Detroit News. So uh, uh, do you see any serious challenge? I know that Rashida Raid is the one that's uh, challenging uh, her right now, but it seems like uh, there's very little interest in that particular race, even though there's been issues with the way some of the uh, city of Detroit elections have been run. Yeah. Well, the question um, is, is, is Rashida in Detroit? And is she stomping for her candidate? That plays a big difference. Other than that, I mean, I think it's up to the voters come November 2nd. Who are they going to go with? You know. Yeah. And and you know also too, uh, Janice Winfrey would just uh, reveal that there's liens against her property for back taxes. Um, she's never you know really spoken out on that, and she also turned down an opportunity to go and debate Denzel um, on Channel Four, I believe it was. So not a lot of interest, and in I think she's going to cruise the election. Yeah. Well, I want to thank everybody. I appreciate today. We have Brandon Bryce as well, the traditional panel of Scotty Bowman, Tom Chowski, and Ed again for putting us here on the Tuesday night, 10 a.m. The Superstation. My name is Robert Pagano. We'll be back again with you next week. The Word Network has been broadcasting inspirational messages around the world since the year 2000. And we keep getting bigger and better and more innovative. Seen all around the world, we bring you the best teaching, impartation, singing, and inspiration. If you want original programming, we have that too. The Word Network is your exclusive source for all things inspiration. And we can be found on every device imaginable. If you want to be uplifted and inspired, you need The Word Network. 
We've got you covered from sun up to sundown. My name is Mark Fakano. You know, part of democracy is that you have people that are on both sides of the issue. And also, anyway, you're going to get both sides of the issue. One of the issues is called qualified immunity for police officers, which is being debated in Congress. Police resignations or retirements are the type of occupation that's very difficult to keep people locked in. We are 910 AM Superstation. Hello, Detroit. 